May the 4th be with you. Let's dig into some Star Wars stuff today. We got some surprising news about the Prince of Persia Sands of Time remake. And I've got my final reviews of Moon Knight and Nintendo Switch Sports. All that and the latest in everything cool today in The Rundown. Hey, welcome to The Rundown, everybody. My name is Victor Lucas, and I'm so excited to see you here today. May the 4th be with you. Happy Star Wars Day. And uh, that is my dedication. My dedication is to this young man. This is uh, taken from uh, 1977. I said, uh, may the 4th be with this kid in 1977 who still loves Star Wars just as much today as I did 45 years ago. Star Wars means so much to me, obviously, like a lot of people in the, that love video games and that make video games and, and are in this industry, and a lot of the people that I've been able to interview over the years, Star Wars really affected all of us. It opened up this sort of creative wellspring in so many people. I think a lot of imagination just erupted out of Star Wars back in the day. I'm eternally grateful to what George Lucas and company provided us as entertainment, but also as something to kind of aspire to and to be inspired by. I, I adore Star Wars and I always will. And it's fun to celebrate it on uh, May 4th every year. So thank you, Star Wars, and happy Star Wars Day. And speaking of Star Wars Day, let's take a look at some of the first stories that we've got for you in the rundown. Lucasfilm dropped a new trailer for Obi-Wan, which is going to be streaming on May 27th. And uh, uh, we've got uh, Ewan McGregor back in the role. And this is going to be, uh, I think, a very nostalgic, emotional trip for a lot of us longtime Star Wars fans. We're going to be seeing an actor that I think we universally admired in his performance. He definitely channeled Alec Guinness when he put his Obi-Wan together in the prequels. But there was just something uh, roguish and charming and... Uh, you know, he was a young character. He, he wasn't a fully formed Jedi Knight when we first got our eyes on, uh, on Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan. So it's going to be very interesting to see where this story goes. Um, you see Joel Edgerton reprising his role as Uncle Owen, which is great. But now we're going to see a, a wizened Obi-Wan and somebody that's been through a lot. He's being pursued and hunted by, uh, you know, these Sith uh, warlords that are trying to hunt down the last remaining Jedi that are out there. Uh, and it looks like we're going to be on the, you know, in the sands of Tatooine, but also in some pretty cool urban environments. There's going to be some space uh, travel and possibly some space dogfights and battles and things like that, which I'm looking forward to. But it does look like there is a tremendous amount of visual effects applied in this film, in this show that looks like a movie. This looks like a really nice, close adherence to what we've seen with the films. And uh, I am very, very much looking forward to this, uh, this incredible looking series. I hope it lives up to our expectations. I think that there is, uh, um, you, you know, I think maybe a little hesitation coming off of the Book of Boba Fett that it didn't really hit every single mark that it tried to hit. Um, but Mando was incredible, both seasons of The Mandalorian. So uh, if it's at that caliber, I think the Obi-Wan Kenobi show is going to be incredible. And of course, that what they do with this new trailer is they tease that Darth Vader is coming back, played by Hayden Christensen. Um, and presumably there's going to be a big uh, lightsaber battle with the two of them. Um, which could be incredibly exciting. We don't have long to wait. It's weird that we aren't getting it today. Uh, we got the final episode of Moon Knight, which I'm going to be talking about here in a second, but we didn't get a new Star Wars show today. We did get um, another reveal in addition to the May 27th trailer of launching today for uh, Obi-Wan. We also got a, a, a look, thanks to uh, GameSpot and Hasbro, a look at some retro Star Wars toys that you can pre-order on May 26th. And uh, I guess these will be coming out later this year, but they're based on the old Kenner line, complete with all the classic packaging and the, you know, not cinema accurate look of these different types of characters. Everything was a little bit more cutesy, a little bit uh, deformed, especially when you looked at Han Solo. This was always the reviled figure back in the, I mean, everybody wanted Han Solo, but that was a pretty lame Han Solo. And they remade the lame Han Solo, which is absolutely wild. Uh, so these are going to be coming out later this year. I, it's, you know, certainly a nostalgic thing because I collected all of these things back then. I remember all of that packaging. I love that they have rough edges on them and everything like that. I think it's pretty cool, but it's also pretty nerdy and pretty niche that those things are out there. I have to tell you, I'm excited that they're making them again. 
but I won't be collecting them again. I will leave that to the other Star Wars diehards out there. I am excited, though, that uh, starting today, there is a behind the scenes on the Book of Boba Fett. They've put up a Disney Plus gallery kind of look at the making of this series, which had its ups and downs. Not everything about it was, you know, everything that I loved about Boba Fett. I think there was maybe more mystery revealed than um, we kind of wanted to examine, you know, like the the... Boba Fett stories that we played in our minds were just a little bit cooler than what was uh, offered up in the show. I still want to find out how it was made. I want to see the, I haven't watched this yet, so I want to see these interviews and go a little bit behind the scenes and talk to, you know, hear from Robert Rodriguez and all of the very competent cast that was in this show. And I feel a little bit bad for some of them. Like Ming-Na Wen is just incredible. What a performer. She's good in everything that she's in. Uh, that they didn't get that sort of Mando caliber experience out of the series. Still, I think it's gonna be a fascinating look at how this show came together uh, with lots of cool behind the scenes moments. You see Mark Hamill kind of repri reprising his Luke Skywalker. Of course, he was all CG to um, make him look like a much younger character. But uh, yeah, really looking forward to diving into this. And that is available on Disney Plus right now, as a matter of fact. And something else that's available right now for the Lego Star Wars Skywalker Saga game is a bunch of DLC. And, and more stuff was announced today. They're going to have uh, DLC uh, surrounded, uh, 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 surrounding a bunch of characters like the characters from the Bad Batch. So you're going to be able to play as the, uh, the Bad Batch characters, which is pretty cool. It's not like story packs. They're not giving you new missions or new levels. They're just taking a lot of the uh, um, the characters and placing them into the existing worlds that are built for the game, which is uh, tremendously fun, but also very large. There is a ton of environment to explore in this game. And so you've got... Uh, the Bad Batch, you've got the Rogue One characters, they've got, uh, some of these are available already, Season 1 of The Mandalorian, so you can play as IG-11, I forget who this character's name is, uh, but uh, they make a, a, a pretty explicit announcement that Grogu is not playable, he just follows Mando around, which is kind of cute. They have a Season 2 of the uh, Mando uh, uh, characters coming in there, so you can play as Ahsoka Tano and Fennec Shand. All of those different characters are going to be playable from uh, Mando 2. They've also got uh, young Han Solo from Solo and young uh, Lando. Uh, from from the solo film. They've also got uh, a bunch of troopers from across the Star Wars universe and also a lot of the classic characters, which I guess are more like classic Lego versions of these different characters because they're, uh, you know, the classic persona of these characters already exists in the game, which does a tremendous job of giving us a little bit of all nine of the Star Wars movies. Um, tremendous game. Love Lego Star Wars, the Skywalker Saga, and I can't wait to, you know, dive in and re-explore some of these levels with some of these awesome characters. Now, I've got a, a nice little treat to revisit uh, for longtime EP fans. One of the things that we always love to do around Star Wars is work with LucasArts. It used to be LucasArts, now it's Lucasfilm Games. And it's uh, developers and create some pretty fun segments. And uh, we did that with all of the cast members of EP. But Jeff Keighley got to do a couple of different things. And I was lucky enough to direct it and work with uh, some incredible game, to, game makers. One of my favorite Star Wars video games of all time is Star Wars Battlefront II that Pandemic made. And uh, we put together a pretty fun segment to celebrate that game. Another EP assignment, another Star Wars Battlefront game, but I hope this one's gonna go better than the last time. Oh, oh. Are you okay? Are you oh my god! Oh my god, are you alright? I don't know what's going on! Oh my god, there's just PTSD! Is it Jeff Keeley signing off for EP? Ah. Hi, I'm Jeff. Hi, Giz. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. Giz. I had a bad experience last time, so hopefully this one's gonna go a bit better. I heard that, absolutely. We've got a lot more security now. We've got bounty hunters and storm See, troopers See, as soon everywhere. as I see Star Wars characters, I know this is gonna go bad. Like, no, everything's gonna be okay this time, Jeff. Trust me. So these are the digs. Uh, do you want a martini? No, not when I'm working, guys. Wow, it's a great facility you guys have here. I'm really impressed with it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, ever since the Empire came, they really kind of spruced up the place. They've uh, added auto turrets, some probe droids, and some holographic projector oh, technology. Do you mind turning it on? I'd love to oh, take I, a look at the game. Yeah, absolutely. I think okay. that's okay. Wow. 
Game looks great. Now, you know, everybody loved the first Battlefront, but what new things are you guys doing in the sequel? One of the coolest things we have is space combat. We have fully realized space environments. We've got uh, interiors and exteriors. We've got hangar combat and then seamless transitions into space combat. We've got bombers, flyers, transports, and are really, really kind of capturing that whole Star Wars feel. What about characters? I heard you might actually be able to play Yoda in this game. Yeah, you get to play all the classic heroes as well as all the heroes from the new trilogy. You get to play as General Grievous, as Dooku, as the Emperor, as Darth Vader, as well as all the good guys from both trilogies, Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, Leia, Chewie. In multiplayer, the, the heroes are a reward for being the best player on the field. So if you're the best guy, you get to be Luke Skywalker, while the best guy on the, on the Empire side gets to be Darth Vader. And you can actually confront each other in the middle of the battlefield. So yeah, that's a, that's a glimpse of the game. No, the game looks fantastic. Now the one thing I forgot to ask you about was weapons. I mean, we have lightsabers, but what else do we have in this we game? We have a ton of new weapons. We've got the Bothan Spy has a uh, has a invisibility cloak. He can use kind of to stealth around. He's got an incinerator. Vader has force choke. That's, um, that's going to be so much uh, fun. Dooku has force lightning. Right. Um, Darth Maul has force leap. He can do all these. Ac oh, hold on. What's this about? Oh, just it's not a big deal. Um, can you throw him in the carbon freezing chamber on 16? What, what do you do to your testers? God, not this again. Okay there, we've had two deaths in, uh, in the conference room. So TK247, TK248, you're up. I need my field weapon, so where are we here? What's going on? Guys are dying in front of me, guess what's going on? You know what? Like I said, these things happen all the time. It's not a big deal. You said this floor was going to be safer. It's just a glitch, really. Fall back. Oh. I also want to introduce you to Dell. He's the lead designer on the project. Sure. All right, Dell, let's do it. Kid Fisto, you are not more the opponent. Get away! Yeah, Dell, hey, it's Jeff with EP. Uh, guess I should swing by, ask you what's new in the gameplay this time? Yeah, for sure. So we ended up adding a bunch of different game modes to the game. We actually added um, capture the flag. We also added assault mode where you actually attack capital ships and try to destroy them before your enemy can destroy your capital ship. We've gone in and kind of improved a lot of the gameplay as well. One of the kind of fun new modes we did was hunt, where you kind of hunt down indigenous species. You go hunt down Ewoks or you hunt down Geonosians on Geonosis. Even going so far as hunting down Wampas on Hoth, they're invading Echo Base and you get to blow away these giant hulking snow beasts that are trying to invade and, you know, kill all the rebels. You know, the game looks great, but it seems like you have kind of a lot of work left to do on it. Yeah, we do, but I'm confident we'll be able to ship on time. Oh, we, hey, it's Vader. And I cannot believe this game will ship on Lord time. Lord Vader, everything's going perfectly according to plan. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Wow. Let me show you what this game is really about. Stop. <laughs> Man, that takes me back. That was always a tremendous amount of fun to work with the uh, the 501st Legion, the Golden Gate Garrison. Uh, they came to Los Angeles and they visited Pandemic. We got a, into a bit of trouble uh, putting that segment together in the studio because we interrupted everybody. But uh, that was uh, a blast and uh, it was really, really fun. I remember just how busy we all were putting all of those shots together in a day. Um, uh, and it was it was crazy fun. Uh, kudos to uh, Tavis Dunn and Aaron Mooney who uh, helped to assemble all of that and make it look as, as uh, nice as it did, especially for the year that it came out, which was almost 20 years ago. All right, let's move on. We have uh, got a Prince of Persia remake that's still headed our way, but it is uh, fraught with 
tra drama and trouble. I was going to say trauma, but it's not trauma yet, as far as we know. Uh, but the uh, development on this game uh, has been taking a very, very long time. This was footage from 2020, actually. And I remember when this trailer dropped, there was excitement for the idea that a remake for Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time was coming. Uh, but um, the visuals for this game certainly didn't look state-of-the-art then. And every year that passes, every month that passes, uh, the game just looks more and more dated and uh, troubled. And so uh, we had a lot of suspicion, you know, all of us fans out there, that potentially this was going to be a game that got cancelled. Um, but nope, that is not the case. There was a new update from the Prince of Persia team. They've got a, they tweeted this out, an update on the development of the Prince of Persia, the Sands of Time remake. And this kind of surprised me, and I suspect it surprised many of you, uh, but this is what they had to say. The development of Prince of Persia, the Sands of Time remake will now be led by Ubisoft Montreal, the very birthplace of the epic Sands of Time trilogy. This decision is an important step, and the team building upon the work achieved by Ubisoft Pune and Ubisoft Mumbai will now take the time they need to regroup on the scope of the game to deliver you the best experience for this remake of an all-time classic when it's ready. We want to thank you all for your continued, uh, continuous support and patience throughout this development. Rest assured that we will update you on the progress in a future update. This is definitely the right move. I think they're reading the room. There have been some pretty phenomenal remakes recently. The expectation is through the roof that this is going to be a, a beautiful tribute to one of the best video games ever made. I mean, it was a 10 out of 10 from both Tommy and I when that game initially launched on PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox, and I think it was on the GameCube as well. Um, and honestly, Prince of Persia hasn't really gotten to those heights again. There's been some good Prince of Persia games, but Sands of Time is a masterpiece, and so it needs to be handled uh, with all of the love and the care that Ubisoft has got w within its um, teams, you know, regardless of where it's made. And I think if uh, the decision is that uh, the Mumbai and Pune teams just weren't up to, you know, snuff, they just weren't able to kind of capitalize on the potential of this, then yes, the right decision is to kind of shift focus. Um, I am still excited to play this thing. I know that a lot of work has already gone into it, and hopefully not all of it is going to be thrown out. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel, though. Is it, uh, you know, a wasted effort? Did you love the original Sands of Time, or could you care less? Is it frustrating that it's taking a lot longer to get this thing made than you initially thought? Or is Ubisoft doing the right thing by shifting development back to Montreal? Let me know in the uh, comments below. My fingers are crossed, though, that it is an amazing re-experience when they finally finish this remake. All right, let's uh, talk a little bit about what Marvel has been up to on Disney Plus with Moon Knight. The final episode of Moon Knight launched today as I am recording this review, and I do want to preface my conversation here uh, with the fact that there will be some spoilers, both within the footage, which is taken from all of the trailers, but also I might get into some of the uh, specifics within the episode and within the series. So if you haven't seen it, uh, now would be a good time to mute for a little while or to look away. Uh, but that's your last warning. Moon Knight has been a tremendously entertaining series for me. I really like that it feels very different from the other Disney Plus Marvel shows, but a lot of the Marvel work in general. This is a character that I didn't really know too much about. He uh, suffers from uh, dissociative identity disorder, so he's got a split personality. He's, he's in one capacity, he is this ruthless uh, mercenary named Mark Spector, and in another capacity, he is this uh, museum a gift shop worker named Stephen Grant and uh, very disparate different personalities that are thrust together and what happens through the course of the series is that Stephen Grant keeps having these visions and nightmares and this is kind of the iconic image of what Moon Knight represents to me this kind of horrific kind of uh, you know shadowy look at what Stephen Grant is going through he's terrified he's looking down the corridor and uh, he sees this this monster coming towards him which is an Egyptian god that he doesn't know of in this particular point in the uh, series and Oscar Isaac just plays it beautifully his eyes are popping out of his head and he's absolutely terrified he doesn't know what's going on and that first episode was just so 
iconic, I think, from the Marvel stratosphere. You know, when people look back at that first episode of Moon Knight, I think that there's some work in there that is just going to be so atypical and so transcendent and so amazing to kind of celebrate again because of the way that it was filmed because you along with Stephen Grant don't know what the hell is going on and so there's all of these weird jump cuts and these you know freaky reflections and and uh, we're mostly with Stephen Grant as he's starting to kind of wake up and realize that there is a lot more going on in his life and it was such a strong episode that there was no way for the next several episodes of Moon Knight to go but down I think you know it's a kind of try to show off all of these different elements and aspects of this character but that mystery was kind of being peeled back for us and so the shock and mis you know mysterious qualities of that first episode are incredible but what happens through the course of the show is that we see both Stephen Grant and uh, Mark Spector kind of come to grips with their shared ownership of this body and the life that they kind of lead together and um, we see you know Oscar Isaac having to have conversations with himself to reconcile his reality you know both as this multiple personality human being but also as this part-time superhero um, and he's an, a superhero that, that is a little bit hesitant to be one you know because he's been uh, trapped in this agreement with this Egyptian god to kind of uh, protect the the, uh, the travelers of the night and that sometimes means that he has to go and kill other people or beat the crap out of other people or you know metaphysical beings like we saw in uh, the first episode of Moon Knight he's kind of morally opposed to that to let you know varying degrees depending on what person persona he is uh, embodying in the moment um, but he, so this is a, a, a central heroic character that is at odds with himself and his position and his mental kind of situation all the way through and so we're on a, on this roller coaster of like trying to determine what exactly is going to happen with this character and at one point um, in the series where it really kind of pivots and turns after we've been a few episodes in we wake up and Oscar Isaac's character, Stephen Grant and Mark Spector, are both in an asylum and they're being psychologically analyzed and assisted by Ethan Hawke's character, Harrow, who is the villain in the show. And it is, you know, once again, a, a level up on the mind bending kind of attributes of this program. And uh, there are some insane cliffhangers. One of them is we end an episode and we've got this CG hippopotamus god and uh, everybody is as you know awestruck as Oscar Isaac plays in the show. And that's, you know, honestly, I got early access to the series. I got to see the first four episodes and that was the end of the fourth episode. And that was the cliffhanger that was left for me. I'm in the asylum and this hippopotamus starts talking to Oscar Isaac and I'm like, what the hell? Oh my God, no. And so we had to wait. Uh, to, well, I had to wait to get caught up, and I finally watched the fifth episode last week and then the sixth episode today. And that was a long-ass wait. That is one thing that I will definitely say about this series is that there is so much happening and so much flying at you and so much plot and nuance in storytelling that it's really difficult to chop it up across these weeks. This was definitely a show ripe to be binged, you know, because there is a lot of minutia and a lot of really intricate detail in the performance and all of these different metaphysical creations and these interesting characters that we don't traditionally see like a, a huge emphasis on Egyptian actors and Egyptian locations and trying to be as authentic to the source material as possible and it was really really fun now the final episode as is kind of true for most of the final episodes of these Marvel shows escalates and we see a massive superhero battle and some incredible visual effects it takes its time though this is definitely a series where you know if you're signing up to watch Moon Knight in action you get that but it's doled out it's not like he's beating up bad guys all the way through it's not like Robert Pattinson's Batman where he was in character even when he was brutal. Bruce Wayne, you know, he's always Batman, and so you never feel like, I remember seeing Dark Knight Rises and turning to Scott Jones, who we reviewed it together, and asking where the hell Batman was in this Batman movie. Um, there, There's a little shadow of that, no pun intended, in uh, Moon Knight. It's like, where's, where's my Moon Knight, you know? Um, but the end and final reveals, they're always satisfying when the character pops up. I mean, the action around Moon Knight is incredible. But the finale with Moon Knight and, you know, the escalation of what the character can do and who he is, is amazing. And uh, 
I did find that the last episode had to work really hard. It had to tie up a lot of stuff. And, uh, you know, there's some deaths that have to kind of be uh, worked out and a lot of, you know, questions to be answered. And it felt choppy. It felt like, oh, my God. All right. Well, we're going from here. We're going for there. It didn't feel like there was, uh, y you know, all of the reasons why we are moving from this location to this location. Or it felt like there were a couple of uh, placeholder props and elements that felt a little pat, like it was just a little bit too simplistic that a, a character would reach for that. And it was there, you know, I'm trying not to spoil too much. Uh, but um it does culminate in a pretty tremendous battle sequence and then a tease for more. Of course, there's a post credit sequence. You can't watch a Marvel thing and not kind of anticipate that. Um, and so I absolutely came away from the show with satisfaction and um, excitement for how this character kind of fits into the Marvel Universe. I really, really dug it, although it was kind of like this, you know, like a really high high at the beginning and some weird twists and turns kind of plot, you know, padding out the plot and trying to figure this out. I honestly feel like this property, it was well served because there was so much nuance and so much detail to get into with, with uh, uh, this character going through so much. But I almost feel like the cohesion of a two hour script might have served this property a little bit better. That's not to say that that's not where Marvel can go now. You know, what, I, I just want them to tell us that more Moon Knight is coming because there is a lot to be excited about in this property, including the introduction of uh, a new hero. Um, and I'm, I'm not spoiling anything around that, uh, but that was crazy fun to watch. And uh, uh, I got chills. I was, I was like, oh my God, this is really cool. This was some of the coolest Marvel action that I've seen. Um, and, and some really interesting psychological intrigue and some cool kind of horror spooky moments in there as well. Uh, and great performances by everybody, but especially Oscar Isaac, um, who by the end of the series is just reveling in his ability to transform mid-sentence, you know, almost Christopher Reeve-like, you know, how he, he would become... He would be Clark Kent and then transform his whole musculature and his voice into Superman. It's that same kind of vibe. Um, in an interesting different tangent with Oscar Isaac playing Stephen Grant and uh, Mark Spector. It's a great show. Absolutely recommend it if you haven't been watching it. And uh, would love to hear your thoughts on that finale. Uh, but uh, I did tweet out already and I absolutely believe this and want this to be true. Marvel, make more Moon Knight for us, please. I'm going to give Moon Knight an 8.5 out of 10. All right, I've already talked a little bit about Nintendo Switch Sports, but I've got my full review for you right now. I've spent a lot of time playing this game, and it is a uh, you know multi-sport experience uh, in the uh, vein of what Wii Sports delivered to us about 15 years ago. You've got tennis and badminton, soccer and bowling, and chambara, which is a sword fighting experience. And Nintendo Switch Sports, I can say, is a heck of a lot of fun. Now, is it as good as Wii Sports was when we, the Wii launched and that game was a pack-in experience? I don't think it is. And I think what Wii Sports had in its favor was the, you know, out of nowhere surprise and this idea of interacting with the television with this kind of uh, um, motion sensing remote control, which really blew our minds back then. I mean, I, you can say what you want to about the Wii shovelware that came out after the, the Wii launched, but Wii Sports delivered. It really did satisfy. Now, Switch Sports, I think, has a lot of great lessons learned from Wii Sports and its derivatives and sequels and things like that, and also probably from all of the uh, copycats that came up after the success of Wii Sports. Um, and, and so it's tuned, and it's really a good looking game as well. We all know that it's taking advantage of uh, some AMD technology to kind of uh, get the most out of Nintendo Switch visually. Uh, so it is a very, very cool looking game. But I feel like one of the things about this title is that it's a, it feels, you know, in 2022, it feels a little bit light on features. And I think especially in terms of that single player 
experience, you know, because you're not always going to have friends around you that are going to want to play this thing with you. And I've, you know, I've reached out to my my wife and daughter to kind of kind of join me in this, and they have a little bit, my daughter a little bit more so, but it isn't taking their world by storm right now. So what the game kind of forces you to focus on, and to its credit, it's quite wonderful, is getting online, playing with other people. And so you can jump into any one of these sports and they've got a pretty solid online experience here that rewards you for the more time that you spend finding competitors and honestly just spending time online playing these games. There are rewards that come out of this. That's really the bread and butter of the game. Now you can play single player against the AI uh, but it doesn't really reward you other than your kind of training and, and testing the systems and figuring out how to do everything. When you get online, you are competing with the skills that you've acquired, but also the, the skills that you are learning as you're watching competitors and as you are, um, you know, figuring out all the mechanics of each of these different mini games or each of these different sports. Um, and they all utilize the Joy-Con controller in a, a, you know, a motion control capacity. So you have to take the Joy-Con off of the switch and you have to waggle, you have to, you know, get into it physically, whether that's trying to set up a shot in volleyball or slam down the, uh, um, uh, is it the cock? Is it? the hell is it called in badminton uh, uh it, i think it is right you, you hit the the shuttlecock hit the shuttlecock in badminton or the tennis ball got caught really weird in the middle of this nintendo switch sports review or hurl the bowling ball properly down the lane in bowling you have to physicalize every one of those experiences and that was the sort of vision realized with wii sports and it's uh, it's picked up here for sure. And I did find the occasional misalignment or some, some things to quibble about with the Joy-Con functionality, uh, playing it off the television set. But, you know, it just happened once or twice. It really, there was some pretty solid one-to-one uh, -one kind of recreation of those motions in this game, which I, I think we have to applaud Nintendo for, for sure. And so what happens when you play online is you compete. I, I just so happen to have this tasty little clip here of me winning everything. Uh, you compete against uh, different players and uh, you're rewarded. You level up and eventually you're going to get into the pro circuit and then you're going to get all kinds of gifts. Like in this particular case, I think I win this uh, black cap and then I can put that onto my character and that's the I think the the hook of the online experience is that you're constantly being rewarded and you're rewarded with customization options and ways to express yourself within the, within the game which I think is incredibly important and we've seen that become a valuable part of every online experience out there whether you're playing Call of Duty or Fortnite or Apex Legends or whatever and so there is a bit of that too and what you start to recognize is the more that you play online is that people have unlocked these sort of emoji icons that they can uh, express themselves with and there's different clothing options that they can express themselves with. There's different ranking uh, settings that people have underneath their names. And you know, of course, I started playing it on the weekend with everybody else out there. And I've noticed that people are just playing this thing like crazy. And so they're riding up the scale towards that A. Um, I'm still low. I'm still in the D's. Uh, but I, you know, I've put a ton of time into bowling. Bowling is the game that has really captivated me like this is a, a an experience where not only do you have the traditional bowling you know straight down the lane kind of gameplay but there are also these advanced lanes where they give you these puzzle challenges as well and these kind of suck i have to say <laughs> when you play online because you don't know what's coming next and uh, i gutter balled a bunch of different shots and that drove me insane because the uh uh, you, you, you know, the drive to win is real. The competition is fierce and people are getting so freaking good. And so when you uh, are playing some of these advanced lanes, uh, it can become uh, in incredibly frustrating when your ball bounces off one of the pegs and gutters. And uh, it's so competitive that if you don't do well on that first shot, you're kind of screwed because uh, in bowling specifically, you, they start eliminating uh, players right away. So you get three shots at, at uh, getting as many strikes or, or uh, spares as you can. Um, and then if you don't make it, then you uh, uh, get eliminated and uh, you go sit down on the bench and you endure as much as you can till you quit spectating um, and you feel 
uh, very bad about yourself. And there's no, there's no way that you can't because it, it just gets into your soul. At least for me, bowling is really fun. It is very much, though, an identical experience to what we bowling was back in the day. Um, the Chambara experience, which I think was in a, a Wii Sports Resort game or something like that. I think we've seen this kind of sword fighting thing before. You can notice I tried the twin swords in this particular clip and the motion sensing was, the tracking was off a little bit. And so my blades kept kind of tying together like they were magnetized or something. I had my hands apart, but they, they kept sort of moving towards each other. Didn't stop me from kicking this character's butt though. And uh, you can celebrate your wins a little bit. I, I, I did all right with uh, jumping into this game. I mean, you, you can block, but essentially it's how fast can you smack the other guy and knock him off of the platform. And it, it is quite satisfying when you knock him off and they fall into the water. That is pretty fun. Fairly simplistic in terms of um, strategy and uh, the, the core reward of play, you know? I think we get a little bit more value out of playing something like tennis, which definitely feels a lot like classic Wii Sports tennis as well. Um, this though, is it, it's interesting when you look at a game like this and you compare it to soccer, you, I'm not controlling where my character is moving. This is purely a timing and um, angle-based experience on my swings. So I have to, and I'm also in control of both the character that's in the background and also at the net. And so you can swing whenever the time feels right for you. And there is definitely a strategy to use that, that uh, front character. But I think it's so ingrained in us for people that have been playing tennis games forever to only kind of look at the, uh, at the character in the background there. And you're trying to not, you know, return the shot so that it falls out of bounds. Um, and you can get some pretty good rallies going because people have been playing this already for about a week now and they're getting better and better at it. Um, and it is quite fun when you uh, win, uh, but it also um, is quite humbling when you lose. And I actually fully lost here. It's seven to nothing. Um, everything is kind of scored so that the games are fairly quick as well. So this one didn't last too long. So it was, uh, they, they got every point and I, uh, I said, oh, the hell with that. I'm going to play this thing again. And then uh, I started to do a little bit better. But there's different uh, types of courts that you can play on. But again, you're, I'm not controlling where the character is running. I'm just, you know, swinging at the right time. In contrast, when you play the soccer experience, I am, you know, running as this character, trying to go all over the place and, and uh, uh, you know, hit the ball at the right time, using motion controls, so swiping up and down and making curved hook shots and stuff. I got a nice assist there from someone uh, from not in Canada, likely, and uh, got a goal. Uh, you can see my, my tag is Judgment Dad. That's... Uh, one of the uh, the quirky mottos and stuff that you can pop into this game. Um, so so I found soccer to be pretty fun, but I, as I said in my first uh, you know thoughts on the game, it reminded me a lot of Rocket League, and I'd way I'd much rather play Rocket League than uh, um, the soccer experience. But I did enjoy soccer, and in fact, I think soccer was my second favorite experience out of this list. Badminton is a lot like tennis, as you would expect. Uh, you got to smash that shuttlecock. Um, and, and again, you're not controlling where the character's running. It's all just timing and angles. And uh, and also, I think, in terms of uh, getting the aggression out and hitting that thing as hard as you possibly can. Fairly straightforward to play. Uh, physics feel great, though. Um, I do feel like these games would benefit from being able to take control of the character. And I don't know why Nintendo wouldn't also offer that up. You know, it's weird that you have it in soccer and you don't have it in tennis and badminton. Volleyball, I can kind of understand because there are, um, there, you have to do the set shots, the bump shots, the spikes and the blocks. There's quite a bit of animation that you kind of have to trigger with your motion controls. And it does get a little convoluted, at, you know, especially because you're, you know, trying to, in your mind, understand the 3D math of where the ball is when we're behind the ca character with the camera here. Um, but, you know, it's it's fairly straightforward once you get the, uh, the, the feel for it. And again, this is a game where you can play with up to four people online. Um, and there is a lot of teamwork and, and sort of sharing responsibility with the other uh, players that you're playing with. And it does feel good when you get those wins, you know. It definitely does feel... Uh, like the collaboration and, and uh, cooperation, um, it just, it, it's a nice extra benefit and another part of the treat of playing online. I, I just, I feel like Nintendo should have countered the game um, in terms of single player with the same kind of 
value and reward as playing online. There should have been, and maybe there will be in updates because there's going to be new content. Golf, I think, is coming soon. Uh, and Nintendo's done a really good job with uh, both Mario Golf recently and Mario Tennis of adding all kinds of content after the, the launch. So I expect a lot more stuff and a lot of tweaks and, and embellishments and improvements is going to come, especially because Nintendo's tracking all the data and watching people play online. But I, I feel like there should, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a story mode or something like that, but there should be something that takes you into the game um, that makes it fun to just play it alone, you know, and just get in there and have a good time uh, jumping across from sport to sport and, and uh, um, unlocking things. And you're really not. I mean, the, this is almost, it almost exists purely to guide you towards playing online. And I don't have a problem with that, but I just feel like Nintendo's done such a good job at, at heaping in all kinds of value with their sports stuff. And we've got uh, Super Strikers coming up pretty soon here, the, the soccer game that Next Level's working on, and hopefully that's incredible. Um, that I, And I feel like we've come so far from the early days of Wii Sports that I, I, I expected a little more. There's no other way to say it. Like, I think it's really fun and Bowling has got its hooks in me. I'm going to continue to play it, and I'm definitely keeping my eye on what kinds of new additions are coming into this thing. But I don't see myself playing tons of chambara or badminton or tennis um, or volleyball. I'll probably be focused almost exclusively on playing more soccer, and I'll be playing a lot more bowling. Um, so I, I think this is a solid game. It's definitely in a, you know, a wonderful homage to the glory days of Wii Sports, but I don't think it hits those heights. And it's not because of the production or the, the quality of the experience or the amount of stuff, uh, you know, uh, sports. Yeah, I think it's just the expectation that, uh, you know, when Nintendo publishes a game, you're going to be overwhelmed by all of the additions and nuances and, and uh, elements that they've included in their uh, first party title. So I'm going to give Nintendo Switch Sports a 7.5 out of 10. All right, I've got just a couple more things to tell you guys about. Uh, we know that Sonic is having a very big year, first with the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 movie, which is a certified fresh massive blockbuster that's made tons of money. We also know that Sonic Origins is going to be heading to consoles and the PC on June 23rd, and we're going to be able to play uh, the classic Sonic the Hedgehog games from the Sega Genesis and Sega CD. Um, and there's some new animation that's been included in this, which looks pretty damn solid. Um, I also some consternation about some of the stuff that you know is going to be included in the special edition and uh the bonuses and also the fact that sega has started to delist some of these classic games from some uh e-shops and stores out there in a bid to try to you know get people to recognize this as the definitive new collection of these classic titles um, and you're going to be able to play as sonic knuckles and tails through all uh, throughout all of these different classic games then they've been remastered into widescreen mode which is pretty damn cool um, but there's more sonic stuff that's headed our way we've got that sonic frontiers game uh, but netflix also announced in a you know a look at a bunch of different animated shows that are headed our way that they have got something coming up around sonic it's called sonic prime and they revealed just a taste a little bit of of, uh, the new look for Sonic the Hedgehog. This is all being made actually in Vancouver. So there is a chance that I might be able to uh, visit the studio and find out a little bit about the uh, behind the scenes on the show. But that's going to be coming out later this year. And I think uh, Sonic fans out there are probably having the best year of their, <laughs> their lives in uh, 2022. There is more than a, enough fun stuff in the Sonic oeuvre for us to be uh, excited about. So fingers crossed that Sonic Prime delivers. Uh, we'll be able to watch it very soon. All right, you guys, that's going to do it for the rundown today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be back again soon with a brand new episode. Happy Star Wars Day to everybody. Hope you're enjoying some fun Star Wars stuff wherever you are. Thank you for uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EPN TV, and following our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash EPN. Your support means the world to me. Thank you, everybody. May the Force be with you. We'll see you soon, and until then, play forever.